Welcome to episode 203 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. I'm the host, Kim Newlove. Angel Bivens and Dr. Wendy Stefan return to the podcast today to discuss poison myths and misconceptions. Both women are educators at Poison Centers. Angel is a pharmacist from Maryland, and Wendy is an epidemiologist from Florida. You'll hear them introduce themselves in just a few minutes. This episode kicks off a five-part series about poison myths and misconceptions. Now, this is in honor of National Poison Prevention Awareness Month here in the United States. Every March is National Poison Prevention Awareness Month. We have an amazing free resource here in the United States known as the Poison Helpline. The number is 1-800-222-1222. If you get nothing else out of listening to this series, please know that America's Poison Centers are there for you at no cost, 24-7, 365. Just call 1-800-222-1222. Now, before we move on with this show, I need to share a quick disclaimer. Listener discretion is advised. Some of the topics we cover in this series include children putting weird things into their mouths, poisonings, injuries, and death. These are sensitive topics. If you have little ones or impressionable individuals of any age listening with you today, listener discretion is advised. Thank you. Now, let me tell you a little more about this series and how it works. Wendy, Angel, and I will discuss at least 18 poison-related myths and misconceptions over five episodes. Why five episodes, you may wonder? It's because this conversation was originally two hours long. We love talking about poison prevention. Now, two hours is a little bit long for one episode, in my humble opinion. So I broke the conversation up into bite-sized chunks. If you're wondering which 18 poison-related myths and misconceptions we're going to cover, I'll share that list of topics with you right now. Here we go. Number one. Universal antidotes and poison neutralizers. Number two, antidotes listed on product labels. Number three, who staffs poison centers? Number four, where poison center calls come from. Of course, we know it's the home, but where else? Number five, now this one might surprise you, the age range of individuals exposed to poisons. Number six, labels. We're pharmacists. Quit thinking about the labels you put on a bottle. (laughs) We're talking about will you get labeled a frequent caller or a bad parent if you call a poison center often? Number seven, childproof containers. Are they really childproof? Number eight, we'll talk about which age group poison prevention education helps most. Number nine, Myth or fact, people don't get poisoned by things that taste bad. Number 10, myth or fact, poisonings are always accidental. Number 11, do poison center staff stay in their own lane or are they actually crime-fighting ninjas? Number 12, misconceptions about pharmaceutical-grade prescription fentanyl. Number 13, Myths about opioid overdose and recovery. Number 14. Myths about herbal, natural, and organic remedies. Number 15. How movies and TV shows affect our perception about poisonings. Number 16. What's really going on behind social media trends, like the Tide Pod Challenge, NyQuil Chicken, and so on? Number 17. Which substances are youth actually abusing most right now? And number 18, resources for my listeners, who are typically pharmacy people, students, pharmacists, technicians, and professors. Anyone, of course, is welcome to listen. But when we made this episode, we had pharmacy people in mind. When you as a pharmacist don't know where to turn for reliable information, what happens? the door for misinformation and misconceptions opens. People will Google things. 
So please tune in to part five for resources. And part five also includes a wrap up of the whole entire series. So we've got a great series for you. As you can tell from the list, there's a lot of information in this series. And now as you listen, I want you to remember that you're listening to a very long conversation that has been divided up. Part one introduces Angel and Wendy. Then we'll discuss myths and misconceptions about universal poison antidotes and poison antidotes listed on product labels. We'll pick up with who staffs poison centers in part two. If you find this in the future, I know people sometimes look at my backlog. You might be finding this in 2024. Feel free to binge this entire thing. It's all great info. That does it for the intro about what this series is about and why you should listen. One last thing before I roll the interview. I realize that this may be the first time you've ever listened to my podcast. So, if you're new to the Pharmacist Voice podcast, welcome. Again, my name is Kim Newlove, and I'm the host. I'm a pharmacist by training, but I'm not in clinical practice anymore. I made a career transition to voice actor and podcast host. Think of me as a medical narrator and a podcast host. I help my clients get their point across in the medical space. Among other things, I narrate audiobooks for women pharmacist authors, provide medical narration to clients in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and continuing medical education industries. I also narrate content for explainer videos and e-learning projects. Why did I become a voice actor and a podcast host? I was inspired by my nonverbal son who has autism to combine my background as a pharmacist with my speaking voice and launch my business, The Pharmacist Voice, in 2017. My son Craig helped me realize the power of having a voice and using it. My solo podcast episodes are about some aspect of being a pharmacist, a voice actor, a pharmacist podcaster, or my career transition from pharmacist to voice actor and podcast host. My interview shows feature a variety of people, like Angel and Wendy, who use their voices to advocate for something, educate in some way, or entertain so that you are inspired to use your voice too. This is episode 203, and you can find the show notes on my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. Just click on the podcast tab and search for episode 203. Without further ado, here's part one of my Poison Myths and Misconceptions discussion with Angel Bivens and Dr. Wendy Stefan. Hi, Wendy and Angel. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice Podcast. Uh, or should I say, welcome back to the Pharmacist Voice Podcast. It's good to have both of you with me here today. Well, thanks for having us. It's always a pleasure. It is awesome to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, you are my specialist in poison information. You are who I rely on as guests to talk about poisoning prevention. And as it is March, we have to talk about this, right? When is National Poison Prevention Week? This year, um, the dates are March 19th through 25th. Um, so we've been celebrating National Poison Prevention Week for more than 50 years. It was originally sworn in or or. Uh, created under President Kennedy, actually. So we've been doing this a lot. Um, and we're really proud uh, to be part of a sort of national effort with a lot of different organizations. So poison control centers are just one of the, the groups that celebrate this out in the community. And certainly pharmacists do. Well, and thank you for the important work that you do. I know that, Wendy, you're at the Poison Information Center in Miami, Florida, right? That's correct. Down here in South Florida. And then we've got Angel, who is with the Maryland Poison Center. Now, for anybody who missed the Pharmacist Voice podcast, episode 27 featuring Wendy and episodes 87 and 141 featuring Angel, I'm just going to have these girls give a little introduction. Why don't we start with Wendy first? Sure. So um, so again, my name is Wendy Stefan. I'm the educator and epidemiologist at the Poison Control Center that serves South Florida. Um, so we are located in Miami. Um, and so we have a lot of interesting, uh, you know, sort of unique poisonings that happen down in this part of the world. Um, and so my background is epidemiology. I have a doctorate in, in epidemiology from the University of Miami. Um, and we serve 
all people from from our offices um, of all ages. And, and I think we'll get back to that. But it's my pleasure to be here. Excellent. Thank you. And Angel, could you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Angel Bivens. I am the assistant director at the Maryland Poison Center. Uh, I've been here. I always tell people I've been here since, um, you know, dinosaurs ruled the earth. Um, (laughs) But I have been here a long time and I've pretty much done all of the jobs at the Poison Center. So I started off as a poison specialist. I'm a pharmacist by training. Uh, So coming on to the uh, Pharmacist Voice podcast is near and dear to my heart. Um, So I started off on the emergency lines, answering calls, um, moved into the public educator role, um, did that for quite a few years, uh, and have most recently um, landed into the land of administration. So I oversee all of the pub pub ed, public education, um, and the messaging that goes out, but I also have some responsibilities with regard to operations of the center scheduling and and things like that. Um, So... You know, all of the stories that Wendy and I tell uh, will um, be true. Um, you know, we, we have both been with the Poison Centers for um, for quite a number of years. So uh, we have a lot of interesting tales to tell. Um, the Maryland Poison Center is located in Baltimore. We're part of the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Um, so we do cover the, the, the state of Maryland, um, but we both get calls from outside of of our areas as well. So, um, and we'll touch on our, the folks that answer the call so that, you know, uh, that we're qualified to answer everything. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Angel and Wendy. Great job. And I just want you to know, I love listening to you girls talk. We had a planning meeting in November and I must say, I just kind of sat back and listened. It was so interesting. I love poisoning prevention education. I have done that as a volunteer for my local chapter of Safe Kids Worldwide. It is Safe Kids Greater Toledo and being a poison prevention educator just in my tiny little role that I play locally has been amazing because you can make such a big impact with so little information. And one of those pieces of of information is sharing the poison helpline phone number. And I know you both know it by heart, but Angel, would you share that with us, please? Sure. The phone number is 1-800-222-1222. And I think I speak for Wendy in that we truly appreciate volunteers out there because most poison centers have only one educator to cover and to educate the population in their entire service area. Um, So we can use as many volunteers as possible. So to all the listeners out there, if you're intrigued by all of the various poison safety podcasts that um, Kim has done, please reach out to your local poison center and reach out to the educator and see if there are volunteer opportunities for pharmacists to help educate the public. And let me just jump in and say Safe Kids Worldwide is a tremendous partner. Um, you know, we have our little hat that we wear that's poison, but what's beautiful about Safe Kids Worldwide is that I can really point parents there and say, you know, it's not just poisoning you have to think about for your four-year-old or your 15-year-old. Um, you know, there are all these other things and Safe Kids really pulls it together and they're really um, epidemiologically based. So it's not just this could happen, but they're really uh, focused on sort of act actual patterns of uh, injuries in the community. I agree with that 150%. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, if there are any pharmacists out there looking to volunteer as a poison prevention educator on a tiny little local level, okay, we're not promoting you to a PhD here, but on a local level, showing kids pretty poisons, going to health fairs, giving out pamphlets, promoting the Poison Center helpline. You know, those are things that you can do through your local chapter of Safe Kids Worldwide. I know this sounds like a commercial for Safe Kids, so I'm going to (laughs) roll into what we're really talking about today, which is poison myths and misconceptions. Because the month of March, for me, I always think about poisoning prevention education, National Poison Prevention Week, and poison myths and misconceptions is a great topic for today so that we can get into the theme of Poison Prevention Week and Poison Prevention Month. So we brainstormed all kinds of different topics to discuss, and these ladies, Angel and Wendy, are going to do an amazing job talking about all these poison myths and misconceptions. Now, to get it started, 
I want to talk about the myth that there is some sort of a universal antidote or poison neutralizer. Whoever wants to go first, what is the myth or the misconception about this? Uh, Angel, should I jump in? Go ahead, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a really interesting one, and um, and it's something that has like regional and um, sort of international flavors, as it were, right? So it is not unusual that people do have a belief that there is one thing you do for poisoning. Um, and so in our community, certainly we see a, a really strong belief that milk um, is just, you give milk for any poisoning and that, um, and it's interesting because oftentimes when people experience something or, or have what they consider a poisonous exposure, they take milk, nothing happens, and they see it as proof that it worked. Um, and what we know is that often what they were exposed to was harmless. Um, and so so what they're seeing is not the a miraculous effect of milk, but the fact that whatever that it was, wasn't a big deal to begin with. And this reinforces that belief. So it, it so it's very interesting. Um, you know, we do occasionally recommend milk for exposures that are irritating, you know, something that causes burning or whatever, but it's not in the, the role of really an, an antidote per se. So here in South Florida, we had an interesting case a few years ago where uh, a parent had brought in a child who was unconscious to the emergency department and was very frustrated that the antidote that they had administered for this poisoning had not worked. And the nurses, of course, were you know, wondering, well, well, what antidote, what do you mean? And she was referring to milk. Um, and in this case, the, the poisoning involved a very powerful over-the-counter cough and cold product. Um, the child, of course, was unconscious. And so hours had passed since the exposure, but the, the parent had just been so confident that milk took care of the problem um, that they hadn't acted. They hadn't called. Um, they really felt like they had taken care of it. And so, you know, the power of that belief um, really, in this case, put that child at risk. Uh, and so we don't want that misinformation out there. Yeah. To add on to the milk um, myth, uh, oftentimes we'll hear callers say, I gave milk to make him vomit. Oh, what? and and it's like okay, so you know, in our community here, there there is the belief that if you swallow a poison and you give milk, milk will make you throw up. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's like a real and, and, mixture, <laughs> right? Yes. So it's um, it's one of those things that we step back and say, well, wait. If you put milk on his cereal, do you expect him to vomit? Well, no, it's because of the poison. So yeah. we educate at the time of the call. Uh, and like Wendy said, there are some times that we do recommend it, but you, usually it's more of a just general dilute. But while we talk about diluting, you can overdo if you uh, oftentimes people say, well, I gave him a lot of water to help dilute it. Uh, and again, that being a universal antidote can be a problem. Case in point, we had a, a mom call and say, my child swallowed bleach and the bottle says, give a lot of water. And I was like, okay, so where are we? Well, he's on his eighth glass of water right now. Holy and moly. I said, yeah. Whoa, ma'am, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Two-year-old should not drink eight glasses of water at one time. Right. So I was more, quite frankly, more concerned about the water at that point. Yeah, that water intoxication is a, yeah. is a real thing. No, absolutely. And I think there's always some truth. Like when I hear these beliefs in the community, I always feel, I can see that there's some kernel of value or tr truth to the, the, the approach. So like you hear sometimes burn toast. Um, and so, the, okay, there's the activated charcoal piece, right? Um, so in the Caribbean, you know, uh, we have a lot of people who, are, you know, have come, come from the Caribbean or have family roots in the Caribbean and they talk about seawater. Um, drinking seawater and, you know, that would sort of induce vomiting um, potentially. Um, uh, in our colleagues in, um, in Illinois and in farm country told us that in their area, it's raw egg. Um, so of course, raw egg has its own problems, right? <laughs> Whether it's an allergy or, you know, salmonella or whatever, um, you know, that has, have, has, can complicate the picture, I guess, is what we're, what we're worried about. Yeah. Um, I think uh, caffeine or coffee has a stimulant, right? Um, he took something to make him sleepy. So I'm going to go ahead and give him coffee to wake him up. Well, uh, especially in the case of alcohol, you're not going to reverse the effects of alcohol. All you're going to have is a wide awake drunk. No, and of course an <laughs> opioid, right? Or you an know, opioid. Coffee right? is not going, not going to help you at all. That. Yeah. So 
Um, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of this is um, the the big time myth is if somebody has taken something that is a poison, we have to get it out. We have to make them vomit. And um, we haven't been using syrup of ipecac for many, many, many years. Um, you know, maybe some of your listeners don't even know what it is. Others are like, yeah, that's that's not something I've been able to order for quite a while. And so, um, you know, we put that myth to rest. Poison centers do not. Um, that's that's just not something in our arsenal anymore. We do not ask callers to have the person throw up. Yeah, it has its own risks, you know. Mm-hmm. So particularly if something's caustic, you don't want it coming up and burning the esophagus a second time. Um, we'd rather neutralize it in the stomach, um, and or something like a hydrocarbon where the vomiting itself could potentially move it from the stomach into the lungs. Um, we wouldn't want that. So it is very intuitive. We get that idea, you know, something bad went in, bring it out. Um, but you know, I think Angel, Angel, and I could list many, many cases where that just made the situation so very much worse. So the one thing to do, we say. Uh, for any poisoning is calling poison control. And we can walk you through what that specific, you know, thing is going to be for your, um, your um, situation. Um, And the theme, of course, for National Poison Prevention Week this year is we're here for you. And we are. Right. We often get calls saying, hey, I'm building a first aid kit for somebody who's having a baby. What is the thing that I need to put in the first (laughs) aid kit for poisons? Simply the phone number, get a magnet, write the phone number down. That's what you need for poison emergencies. It's just, that's that's the universal antidote, quite frankly, is calling the poison center. I love it. Great points. Going back to the bleach poisoning, this kind of leads into something that we're going to get into with the next myth. When that mom read about the bleach poisoning, having an antidote right there on the label of the bleach and the antidote supposedly being water, that wasn't exactly the right thing to do. Calling the poison center and getting individual help for that that person at the age that they were, that's the right thing to do. But a lot of people assume that if there's a product with an antidote on it, that antidote must surely be the right thing to do. What are your thoughts on that myth? Well, especially like in, in the case of drink a lot of water. What is a lot? I mean, I, you know, you ask 10 people what a lot is and that's going to be a different volume. So, so that makes it a little, um, kind of variable, um, and, and not accurate. Um, not, not to mention the fact that the, the information put on there, I don't think that it is reviewed by any body before it's plastered on there. They can, they can put whatever they want. Um, I had an instance where people mistakenly thought that hot tub sanitizer was sugar whenever they were um, making coffee. And that label said, um, eat a milk soaked piece of bread and then follow that with a a combination of egg yolk and lemon juice. And it's like, well, what, what are we trying to do? I mean, the only thing that I can think of is, well, there's your milk with the universal antidote. There's your you know, egg and lemon juice to try to induce vomiting, but it just, it doesn't make sense. There's a whole parade of myths going on right there. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you and know. I mean, I think in in old in the olden times, really, that was kind of the best people could do, uh, maybe, um, you know, and that they were doing their, that manufacturer was doing their best to be helpful. Um, but of course, now manufacturers can list the number for poison control right on their label. That is not a problem. Um, you know, there are certain guidelines for what they need to follow t- to do that. Um, but we're happy to to help um, really for any product, particularly when products are submitted to Poisondex, which is our, our index where we will have the information at our fingertips from the manufacturer. So, you know, we're not guessing as to what's in that product. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, there is a lot of sort of received knowledge um, on managing poisonings that's old, and some of that does persist on old labels, I would say. Yeah, there's a lot of people that don't like to throw things out too. So there might be some very old advice out there, right? I think the record from uh, at our conference, we uh, we have sort of a, a poison history um, thing at our national toxicology conferences where all the poison geeks from all North America come together <laughs> and we have our powwow. Um, one of the things that we, we do is we do this poison history. And I think one of them, they found like a tin from like 1910 of some incredibly toxic pesticide that, you know, someone had found in a barn. And, you know, so, so these literally antique poisons do exist out there um, and we're 
we're, we're prepared to manage them. So, <laughs> and, and yes, they do exist. In fact, uh, Poison Center staff are known collectors of such things. <laughs> yes, my director has a little shop of horrors <laughs> by our uh, entry. I, I made him pull it out of his office so we could all see it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Appropriately titled. Yes, Little <laughs> Shop of Horrors. I like that. Well, going back to these remedies that are published by the product producers, whatever is recommended on there could end up poisoning somebody in addition, right? It's potential. I mean, it, I, I've not seen anything that, you know, besides what, what you know, Angel was saying in terms of like, um, you know, uh, using an emetic, what are they going to use, you know, sending people out to the, the egg yolk. I really haven't seen all that much recently, um, you know, uh, so, but I, but they may persist. I, I don't know. I, have you seen things that are are actual explicitly dangerous recommendations? I have not seen something explicitly dangerous. I just have, I've seen stuff that just quite frankly doesn't make sense. Yeah. So. Or things floating around those beliefs, um, you know, that are floating around. I see it less on labels, but more just sort of the public consciousness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And I think we can all agree though, that trying these homemade remedies actually delays appropriate treatment. And I mean, and not to say there aren't things that can be done that are effective. And that is actually one of the things that we specialize at the poison centers are, you know, okay, we try our very best to, to manage cases effectively. And if that can be done at home, well, then we'll recommend it. So there may be effective things that can be used at home. So for instance, um, you know, I know we had a, uh, we routinely have cases of capsaicin exposure. So someone has misused that, you know, uh, that whatever arthritis cream or whatever in a way that is ill-advised. So I think one of the most memorable ones we had is someone misused it as spermicide. Okay, this was a really, really bad date gone wrong, right? This is a disaster, right? So so what our recommendation actually in that case for this caller was use sour cream. And that is a home remedy, but it was an actually effective, safe method of controlling the pain. And the poison specialist laughed. They said, I could hear her in the background going, oh, thank heaven. <laughs> it was just a great story. But, you know, so so it's not that that home remedies, that anything done at home can't be effective, because that's actually one of the main roles we play in our public health system is to make sure that people who can be safely and effectively treated at home are. We don't want everybody in the ED clamoring for medical care that they don't need. Um, So so the key is correct and expert-led home remedies. (laughs) Which takes us right to expert-led, right? So not stuff that you would read on a label, not necessarily stuff you would find on the internet. Oh, that's being sold for some mysterious product. Yeah, you definitely want to get those home remedies things that we can do at home from the poison experts, because again, we're not going to make the situation worse. We have another really fascinating one that, uh, that I, that we teach here for our rotators that are coming through. Cause that's one of our roles here at poison centers is to train um, healthcare providers um, is uh, this was one that, you know, we learned through, you know, investigation and practice over years that in the home setting, if the child is over one, that, that we can encourage the administration of honey and that honey will actually break the contact between the battery and the tissue. Um, And so this is an example of something most people have in their homes um, that can really preserve tissue while we transport that child. So, So again, it's not that home remedies as as a class is a problem. The idea is matching the the remedy this to the actual collar situation. And we do that so well. And and to emphasize, you give the honey while you're transporting it yes. doesn't replace the need to transport when a battery is injected. Good point. Yeah. Quick question. I think I had some gremlins in my Zoom here. Did you say the honey is a the honey is a remedy for a, a battery ingestion? Were you saying button batteries or Yes. So one, a really serious, potentially serious exposure for a child is when they swallow, a small child swallows one of these larger button batteries and that can be really dangerous because it'll, it'll adhere, um, you know, and actually burn through tissue. So we are going to recommend transport as, as Angel was pointing out. But in the meantime, we found that a way of preserving tissue during transport, because that can, as you know, getting into the hospital and all that process can take time is for the parent um, on the scene to administer honey. 
as long as the child is over one, right? Um, because we worry about infant botulism when they're younger. But um, for that, you know, over one child, that honey can break the contact between the battery and the tissue and buy some time. So I just thought that was such an amazing example of something that a family would likely have on hand that could actually really protect that child improve outcomes for the child. And that was developed through poison centers, which I think is pretty cool. Of course. Yes. And I love that there are educated poison staff there. You know, poison centers have educated staff. It's not just volunteers. Let's talk about that as a myth, because we were actually talking about Safe Kids Worldwide and being a volunteer. And <laughs> let's contrast that with who actually works at poison centers. Are they volunteers or are they educated? Let's talk about that. That's a great question. Who works at poison centers? Are the staff volunteers or are they educated and formally trained individuals? Join me for part two in this series, that's episode 204 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast, to find out who works at poison centers. Thank you for listening to part one of my poison myths and misconceptions discussion with Angel Bivens and Dr. Wendy Stefan in honor of Poison Prevention Awareness Month, March 2023. Please visit thepharmacistvoice.com to read the show notes. In the show notes for each of the episodes in this series, you will find the Poison Helpline phone number, which is 1-800-222-1222, links to resources and websites mentioned, social media links, and much, much more. I realize that listeners will find this series long after it is published, so I'll just wrap it up here so you can quickly move on to part two. Thanks for listening today. Enjoy the series. Wendy, this is the bonus myth. Let's talk about the cost of using the poison helpline. What's the cost? All right. So it's always free. Um, there's been some misinformation out there that we really want to counter. Um, I think it came from TikTok. My daughter, who was a TikTok user, uh, shared this with me. Um, basically saying that, you know, poison control is now charging, you have to pay. Um, and it really stemmed from a misunderstanding where a caller had been referred out for a complex veterinary um, consult. Uh, they had been calling our services for a dog. And um, our, the people on the phones, as you know, are doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, not veterinarians. Um, there are wonderful services out there that do charge up front for veterinary exposure. So we do frequently refer folks out for those services but it is true you have to pay for those. But you never have to pay for our services and we don't want people to hesitate to call when they need help. Awesome. Free. You can't beat that. Yeah. Absolutely. And the number one more time? It's 1-800-222-1222. Thanks, Wendy.